So Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from God. Have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against. Let's say you're talking about somebody behind their back, you're joking, making fun, and all of a sudden you look up and there's the very person. <laughs> Question, are you drawn to want to go over to that person? Or like, oh, great, I was just talking about, I think I'm going to sneak out the back. Your own conscience just does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they're the ones, that, it's like two magnets that are stuck together and one of them turns. First one wants to touch, but they, they, uh, second one wants to get away. They hid. Why? It's because your conscience, so you know, your conscience does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. The polarity is the wrong way. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God, their own conscience won't let them come into his presence. Right? If you're doing a good job at work, the boss says, hey, go and see you in my office. Oh, fine. But if you've been cheating and stealing, taking real long lunches and doing stuff you shouldn't, and the boss says, hey, I want to see you in my office. Do you want to go into his office? No, you're like hesitating. And so Adam and Eve says, man, we blew it. Let's hide. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God again. Let's put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions, man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. Did the fig leaves work? No. And this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. We read it really fast, but if you think on it, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. Something has to die. You think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever. Right? Creation just happens as the first thing ever to die. And Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying. And they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sinned, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear that the animal was dying in their place, that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and he puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had a little blood on it. They were covered in the blood. And so for the rest of their lives, they are wearing the skin of that animal that they watch die in their place. And whenever God sees Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel, Cain decides um, he wants to worship God. But he does an offshoot of the church of the fig leaf. He starts the church of the fruits and the nuts, right? Sort of like <laughs> California. Cain's is a religion of works. And we know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake and you'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. Sweat is work. So here's Cain sweating, planting it, harvesting, and getting all, piles all of his works on the altar. Did his works make him acceptable to God? No. And Abel did the lamb thing. And it's this picture, God's on one side, we're on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. We hide from him because the polarity is the wrong way. And the lamb pays for the sin. So Abraham offered lambs. Moses said, every family in Israel, kill a lamb, put the blood over the doorpost of its house. The high priest brings the blood of the lamb into the holy holies and sprinkles it on the mercy seat. The blood actually changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. Solomon had a thousand of them killed when he dedicated the temple. Finally, John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God's on one side, we're on the other side. Our sins separate us from God, and the Lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you are still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you are approaching God as Cain. I hope I piled enough stuff on the altar Maybe a couple more handfuls of barley. That'll do it. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me. It's this lamb that took the punishment for all my sins in my place. Now, why did the lamb have to die? God is a just God. He cannot help it. That is his nature. He is just, which means he has to judge every sin. Right? He's a God of rules and order. He makes the planets and the sand order, makes the electrons fly on them. He makes it. Everything follows the rules. Man just has the choice as to whether or not he's going to follow them. But he still has these rules. He's a just God, which means he has to judge every sin. Right? And there's a thing in law, silence equals consent. So if there's a sin and God doesn't judge it, he's actually giving consent to it. Remember the old wedding ceremonies? Speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're holding your peace, you are giving consent to the wedding. If God has a sin and he doesn't judge it, and he holds his, he's giving consent to it. And guess what? He's not going to give consent to sin. So his very nature pushes him to want to judge the sin. Do you know that's been implanted in each of us so much that every police drama you see on TV, right, NCIS or whatever, starts off with an injustice done in the first two minutes. 
some innocent person is killed. And you are held captive the rest of the hour, wanting the person that did it to be brought to justice. I mean, that's sort of the theme of all these different movies, and, right? So in the first two minutes of the book of Genesis, an injustice is done. Cain kills Abel. And God says to Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What was it crying? An injustice is done. Innocent guy killed. You're a just God. You got to judge the guy that did it. That's the only side of God that the devil knew. Here's Lucifer, beautiful angel, puffed up with pride. He wants to put his throne higher than the throne of God. God said, you have sinned against me. You are out of here. So the devil goes into the garden, sees Adam and Eve, says, you know what? If I can get them to sin against God one time, God will have to judge them. Gets them to sin, that was easy. Stands back and says, ha, you're a just God. You got to judge him. So God sends this fireball of judgment, but in steps the lamb and takes the hit. So God is just in that he judges every sin. He's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Do you see it? You remember reading the book of Revelation a thousand times, but one thing seems clear. It is God that is pouring out the vials of judgment, breaking the seals, angels throwing censers down. And I thought, why is that? Once and for all, for the rest of eternity, God has to settle the score and judge every sin that he missed along the way. <laughs> so you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there were these sins and you never judged them. Uh, no, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question that God judges sin. But in that sense... Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he's sweating drops of blood. You know, it says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He experienced that day of judgment as if it was a thousand years. You think, what is our, our judgment? Well, without him, our judgment would be eternal damnation. God just took the duration of the judgment and condensed it and increased the intensity of the judgment and he dumped it all on Jesus. If you were to think of it as a scale, an eternal being who is innocent suffering for a finite period of time is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty suffering for an eternal period of time. Wow. Let me say that again. An eternal being who is innocent suffering for a finite period of time is equal to all the finite beings who are guilty suffering for an eternal period of time. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin upon the cross. <laughs> That's why we sing praises to him. You know, it, and then he rose from the dead to prove he's true. Now, the beauty of the, God's plan is that he paid the price for our sin. As long as you're doing the Cain route, thinking that you got to do good works to get to heaven, you will always have this nagging thought in the back of your head, did I do enough? And that alone will cause you to hesitate running and pre hugging the Lord. Is he still mad at me? Did I do enough? I don't know. I didn't know. You're going to hesitate. Once you believe that Jesus paid for it all, and you really truly believe it, that he actually paid every single sin, he paid for every single debt that you had, it's all been paid for. Once you really, you really truly believe it, it's like... You mean there's, there's nothing left to hold me back? There's nothing I have to be ashamed of. There's no, there's no money. I, I don't owe him anything. Every, yeah, it's all been paid. It's all been paid. And you really believe it. You're like, well, shoot. And you run, you can come and embrace the Lord. Your polarity changes and you're drawn back to him and you can worship him and adore him forever and ever. Thank you so much. God bless you.